Let's sing together. I was buried. And I was buried beneath my shame. And who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. was breathing but not alive oh, all my failures I tried to hide it was my tomb till I met you declare this this morning you called my name and I today says that his life mission, his mission in life is to introduce students to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through preaching and discipleship. He and his wife Kristen have been married for 12 years. They have two girls, Camden who's nine and Evelyn who's six. And before he joined us here at Carson Newman, he was on staff at Manly Baptist Church as a student pastor for eight years where he is still a member. Um, it is my honor and privilege to get to serve alongside him day in and day out and um, I can I can speak from experience that he is the real deal um, and I'm very excited to introduce to you today after our chapel band leads us um, our director of campus ministries uh, Jeremiah Young but I had the privilege this morning of talking to you about time and when I think about time here's what I think about uh, two things and I'm gonna reference both but one is I think about a waiting room or a library, or uh, maybe your grandmother's house, or wherever that is for you, but it's somewhere that's so quiet. And this doesn't happen as much anymore because of technology, but I want you to think about somewhere that's so quiet that if there's a clock in the room, you hear the tick every second, okay? The second one I'm gonna mention at the end of my sermon is the movie Interstellar by Christopher Nolan. It's a great movie, I love that movie. And it talks about time in a kind of weird way. But I'm gonna talk to you about time. And college can sometimes be a waiting room. You feel like you're in the middle of your life and you're ready to get out into where you're supposed to go or you're waiting to be sent somewhere or you're waiting to get placed somewhere or go somewhere. And sometimes it can feel like a second. Or there are times when life gets so bad that you just want to get through it and get over it. Or you want to get out of this place. I'm ready to graduate. I'm ready to transfer. I'm ready to go back home. And wherever you may be, and it may, it may be in college you feel like things are going so busy that you want time to slow down so you have more time to get that assignment done. Or you want time to slow down because you enjoy being with your friends. Or you want time to slow down because you feel like once you get out of here, you have to be an adult and now you have to do adult things and you don't want to do that. Wherever you may be, I think the Word of God has something for you today wherever you're sitting in this building. So a little bit about me and my background. I went to a, a Bible college when I went to undergrad and we had to go to chapel four times a week. So I think you guys have it pretty good. Um, but I want to tell you the kind of student I was. We weren't in a church like this. We were in an auditorium. But me and my roommates and a few friends of ours figured out that if we sat in a certain spot, and we, had, we didn't have pews, we had stadium seating, and if we sat in a certain spot and kind of leaned in a little bit, we could all kind of fall asleep at the same time, but it looks like we were paying attention. So I mastered the art of sleeping in chapel and got called out for it a few times. I, was, I didn't do this, but I had friends that knew how to uh, get around the chapel system and trade cards and things like that. So all that to say, I was the guy that wanted to avoid chapel as much as possible. But I was sitting in a, in a 
seat just like you are today. And I remember a chapel speaker coming and speaking on something different than this, but something unique happened in my life. I was already a Christian. I knew that God called me to youth ministry, but I heard from God in such a unique way that my life trajectory changed for the rest of my life. And my hope and prayer today is that if just one of you are in this room today and you didn't, whether you wanted to be here or not, or whether you are listening or not, I hope and pray that somebody's life has changed today by the Word of God. So we're going to turn in Psalm 90 today, um, the Old Testament. If, if you have your Bibles, turn to the middle of your Bible and you'll find the Psalms and either go left or right, depending if you have your phones, pull out Psalm 90. But Psalm 90 is the oldest Psalm that we have because it's written by Moses. And if you study the Psalms and you read Psalms, there's this, in most Bibles, there's wording underneath the Psalm that kind of tell you what it's about or who it's written by. And many times we have the situation in which the author is writing the Psalm, but here all we have is this, Psalm 90, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. So what do we know about Moses? Well, Moses uh, had a really tumultuous birth, right? And then he, he was raised by the Pharaoh's daughter. And then eventually he was used by God to take the Israelites out of Egypt. And then they entered a time of the wilderness for 40 years and went around and around and around and ended up in the promised land. But he was in a time of waiting for 40 years. Now I'm not 40 years old yet, but I have children now. I'm married and I have two girls and I love my girls. I love my kids. I love my wife. Uh, if you hear me refer to my girls, that's my wife and my two children. I, I love them. But 40 years is a long time. It's enough for you to have a life and have a family and have kids. And even back in this time, in the, in the Old Testament, it's time enough to have maybe multiple generations. So what happened in those 40 years is new life started and life passed away. People died. Most of the people that left is Egypt to go to the promised land never got to see it because they died. And Moses is leading the people. And as we know by the people of God in the Old Testament, they grumble and complain a lot. And he's bearing all those things. And my interpretation of this is I think Moses wrote this toward the end of his life because of the context of what we see in this passage. And what he's telling us is he's telling us about time and all the things that they've experienced, but yet he still leans into God and he gives us this statement to number our days. And here's what I want you to take from this today. If you don't hear anything else that I say today, I want you to hear this. I pray that everybody in the room would make every second count for the glory of God. Whatever that is in your life. And so I want you to see in this passage how we do that. And we're going to skip the first 11 verses and start in verse 12 and read to the end of the, of the psalm. And then I'll go back and forth and we'll kind of walk through the entire psalm. So Psalm 90 verse 12 says this, So teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and for many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. First thing I want you to see is if we count the seconds in our life, no matter how big that number is, it's very short. Look what it says in verse 2 of Psalm 90. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever form from the earth and the world, from the everlasting God, you are. And then it says later in verse, later on in the passage that to God a day is like a thousand years. Verse 4, for a thousand years in your sight, but as yesterday when it is past, or watch as in the night. To God our life is short, and in, in at the aspect of eternity our life is very, very short. Here's the other thing we know about life. All of you in this room were born, and all of you in this room will die. Some of you are like, man, he's being really morbid kicking off this chapel. There's hope. There's good stuff. Just bear with me. Verse 1, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. We know, too, that there are generations of people. There were people before you that were in this chapel at Carson Newman. There will be people after you. We know about the generations and here's the crazy thing. 
when you graduate from here or when you graduated from high school or when you leave a place, there becomes a period of time where nobody really knows who you are. Nobody knows you or your family because generations pass and people don't know you. And that's what happened here. Verse 3, you return man to dust and say, return, O children of man. We all live and we all die. And Moses had experienced lots of death in his time on earth. And we know that we are temporary. We get that also from Romans 3. After the fall of man, God tells Adam that he will return to the dust that he was formed from. Ecclesiastes talks about it several times in the book, how life is short, life is temporary. There's a time for everything. And we have this eternal God at the same time who has no beginning and has no end, but we do. And that's what the psalm, that's what Moses talks about. He talks about the shortness of life. Your life is short. And listen to me, student, you are not invincible. Your life doesn't go on forever and you are not unable to die. You will die. The other thing that we see here is that there is a thing in the world called sin. Look in verse 8. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. You are a sinner as well as I am. We make mistakes. And it's not just the mistakes we we make. We don't do things for the sake of God. Inherently, we do things for the sake of us. It's called sin. There's several words in the Old Testament for sin. One One of them is sin. One of them is iniquity. And sin is not just the bad things you do, but it's your inherent, it's your inherent belief that you are the center of the universe and not God. And the nation of Israel was very, very good at sinning. And look at what it says in verse 10. The years of our life are 70 and even for a reason strength 80 and yet their lifespan, but toil and trouble, they are gone and fly away. So they toil and trouble And then they die. And then verse 9, it says, For our days pass away under your wrath, and we bring our years to an end like a sigh. Not only is there sin, but there is God's wrath for our sin. But let me just pause for a second and skip to the end. There is also God's grace. But you can't have God's grace without God's wrath. His grace is not as sweet without His wrath. And the wrath that we experience is because of our sin. It's what separates us from God. And so for 70 or 80 years when people lived, they went on sinning. We are sinners. But thanks be to God that there is a way out of our sin. And his name is Jesus. Thanks be to God that we don't have to live in that way. We can walk in a manner worthy of the gospel as Paul says in the New Testament. And verse 12 transitions to the hope that we have in God. But before we get to the hope, I want you to understand the reason why we need our hope. And the second thing I want you to see is taken away from this text. Let's think about the things that happen in our world. We may live longer than they lived in the Old Testament, but we still have a beginning and an end. Our life is still short. Our life is still full of sin, and our world is broken, myself included. We live in a broken world. Our world is not perfect. Probably more than I've ever seen in my short life, our world is divided. Our world is full of hatred and oppression and strife and anger and disbelief. And newsflash, you don't have to go outside the walls of Carson Newman to see it either. We all fall short of the glory of God. Not only are we broken, but we know it. And here's how I know that. Things like anxiety, depression, and loneliness are all a part of our regular day vocabulary. We know about mental health. We know about the struggles that our friends are experiencing. And we are experiencing too. We are very aware of what's wrong. But here's the thing. We try to fill with what's wrong with still what's wrong. We try to cover up the issue and act like we're okay or we try to add more things to our life or take things away from our life and it's just toiling, toiling, toiling. Or we think this is going to make us happy or this is going to make us good or this is going to stop us from doing what's wrong. 
And it never, ever is fulfilling. The grades you get are never going to make you happy. The boyfriend or girlfriend you have is never going to fill that void or that part in your life that you feel like nothing ever can fix. That drug or that addiction or that thing that you do over and over and over again, the more you do it, the more empty you feel, is never going to make things better. It's never going to fix your brokenness. And yet you crave for more and more and more. And our emotional response sometimes is just to act like it's not there or it's not a part of our life. But when you're in that waiting room of life and you hear the seconds ticking, when you're all alone, it's very clear and apparent. You may not seem like it, you may not show it to your friends. And listen, I'm not talking to you from a stage acting like I don't have my own brokenness. I've got plenty of it. And the more and more you may get to know me, you may see it. And I hope and pray that you don't, but I am broken. I am a sinner falling short of the glory of God. But I want you to see what it says in verse 4. Lord, you have been my dwelling place. Your Bibles may say refuge. Can I tell you this? That in the midst of my brokenness, I run to Jesus. In the midst of my brokenness, I run to God. Not always. Not every time. You know what I do? Sometimes I hold on to it. Say, God, you don't really want this. Sometimes I cover it up and say, God, it's not really there. But he knows all of our sins and all of our iniquities. And when you're sitting there in that quiet moment when life seems to be slowing down, he knows. And here's the great thing about God. He wants you to come to him. God is not standing up in heaven. He's not standing up there with his arms crossed saying, I told you so, like your dad does. He's not standing there looking at you and saying, you're, you're suffering what you deserve. He's actually standing there like we see the father and the prodigal son saying, with his arms open, running out to you saying, my son, my daughter has returned. He's ready for you to return. He's ready for you to come into the fold because he wants to be your refuge. He wants to be your place that you go to in your worst of times. And Moses had experienced 40 years of it because time, as much as we may want it to, does not stop. It does not speed up. It does not slow down. It constantly goes. So what are you going to do with it? Are you going to spend every second giving it back to God? Or are you going to spend every second fighting God and shaking your fist at him over and over and over again by saying, I got this. I don't need anybody else. Because that's what the enemy wants you to do. He wants you to isolate yourself. He wants you to separate yourself from everybody else and figure it out on your own or figure it out with your group of friends. You know why I know that doesn't work? Because the nation of Israel did it over and over and over again. Because when Moses would go up to the mountain to meet with God, he would come back down and they figured out how to have their own gods. Or when Moses would come back to them with what God had said, they said, well, we want to go a different direction. And it never worked out for them. We see that in the New Testament too. That people constantly try to make things right and it never, ever works. But there's hope. Because God has given us life. Look in verse 1 again. Lord, you have been my dwelling place and my refuge in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Verse 4, for a thousand years in your sight, but as yesterday when it was past or as a watch in the night. Here's the crazy thing. God doesn't function in time, but you do. But before your time began, the Bible says that he loved you. Before you had a chance to sin against him, he loved you. Before you even walked this earth, he sent his son Jesus to take the punishment of the sin that you haven't even committed yet. And that grace is available to us. And here's the other thing. God isn't stressed. God isn't worried about your time. Because he's outside of it and he knows. He hears. He sees. And we can know that that eternal grace is there for us and for everybody else. Verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. He will come back to you. He will stand there with open arms. But we have to acknowledge him. We have to run to him. And we talked earlier about God's wrath for our sin. 
And that is still true today because God is not only eternal, but he never changes and his wrath doesn't change. But here's what's different. Back in this time when they wrote about it, they were in the midst of the sacrificial system. And they were about to go into a new place, a new land where God said, here's how you're going to cover your sins temporarily in the Old Testament. When we get to the New Testament and we see Jesus being our eternal sacrifice, our eternal atonement, on the other side of the New Testament, we don't have to worry about our sins and the punishment for them because they've been paid for. The problem is some of you don't realize that God's wrath is still there even though there's God's grace. Even in salvation, God's wrath is still a part of the world that we live in because there is a punishment for sin. But it's been paid for by Jesus Christ. And if you will give your life to him, then you will have life abundantly and life in his name. Verse 14, satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. Before your feet ever hit the ground, think about the love of God that he has for you this day, the next day, the day after that. Because you don't have to walk in anger or in loneliness because there is a God who loves you. You don't have to walk this earth another day thinking about your life is meaningless. Hear me out. Again, if you don't hear anything I say, your life has worth and value. And if nothing else, God loves you. So much that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sins. So that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make our days glad for as many days as you have afflicted us. You can't stop the watch from ticking. You can't stop time from going, but you can appreciate every second that you have because it's a gift of God. Your life is a gift from God. It's not a promise. I would never want this to happen, and I pray it doesn't, but you are not, you are not promised tomorrow. You don't have to wake up tomorrow, but God gives it to you as a gift. So you have two choices. You can either live it for the glory of God, or you can oppose him. And that's it. There's no in between. There's no gray. There's no middle road. There's no third option. It's not A, B, or C. It's A or B. You either live for God or you don't. And let's take another parallel for a second. Let's think about one of the longest times in human history was actually one of our greatest triumphs, but we just didn't know it yet. Because after this was written, after this took place, we don't know how many years, we don't know when it was written, but probably thousands of years after this psalm was written, there would be a man born of a virgin who would come to earth, live for 33 years. He spent the last three years of his life for the kingdom of God. Well, he spent all of his, sorry, he spent all of his life for the kingdom of God, but the last three years he was talking to people about it and bringing up disciples. And at the end of that time, he was crucified and suffered a horrible, horrible death. And all those people that he had impacted with, all those people that he had spent time with were standing there and they, had, they actually thought that he was going to be this king that would come back and reign over Israel, reign over Jerusalem, kick out the other government and give them their power back, give them their land back. But they watched him be publicly murdered. And in that time, from when he died to when he rose again, in my mind, maybe one of the longest times in history because they didn't know what to do. They didn't know where to turn. They didn't know where to go. But on the third day, he rose again. Not spiritually, not as an illusion that thousands of people saw. He came and rose again and walked the earth and talked to many, many people. Why? So that you could inherit eternal life. Your sins could be paid for. And all this wrath, all this injustice, all these things that we experience today could be paid for by none other than Jesus, who was the Son of God, who came to be the spotless Lamb on your behalf. So that you could do what I'm going to ask you to do here in a few minutes. Because here's the truth of it. You may have gone to church your whole life. You may have not entered a church before. But you can't live your life for God every day. It's impossible. The Bible says that we don't. But with Jesus, you can. 
with the Holy Spirit, you can. So that he may increase and you may decrease. So that what people see in you now is not Jeremiah, it's not me, it's not whatever your name is, whoever you are. They see more of God, they see more of Jesus. And that's what living life, making every second count, is like. So now that we know that Christ died for us and we can number our days, then how do we live for him? What do we do? Make every second count for the glory of God. Realize that every second you have is a gift and give it all back to him. No matter how long you're going to be on this campus or how short or what you're going to do after that, live every second for Jesus. Live every second for God and say, God, you've given me a gift of life. And I may not know what that looks like for me yet, but I'm going to give it back to you and I'm going to live for you. No matter what happens, no matter if life is going very, very fast and I'm super busy or life is going really, really slow, I'm going to give you every second of my day. And when I mess up and I don't, I'm going to ask for forgiveness. And I'm going to repent of my sins and I'm going to, I'm going to try again over and over and over again. Because you can live your life for the mission of God, you just may not realize it yet. Does this mean I, I have to look the right part, act the right way, do the right things? No. Those things will come. What it means is by the grace of God, every day when you wake up, you start to think and pray before your feet hit the floor, what can I do today for the glory of God? Instead of saying, whether you say it advertently or not, when we wake up every day and we don't have God, we say, what can I do for my glory, for my honor? How can I make my name fame, famous? How can I do this for me? And the flip side is we wake up every day and say, what can I do for the glory of God every day? Teach us to number our days. And so that can mean a number of things. But what it does is it allows you to see things differently in the world. Because you have opportunities every day to be an encouragement to somebody. You have an opportunity every day to pray for somebody. You have an opportunity every day to tell someone else about the glory of God. But it's a conscious decision. It's an opportunity for you to say, how am I going to use this for that purpose? Because your life is short. And you never know what tomorrow is going to bring. You never know what's going to happen. You never know when your time is going to be up. I pray that for all of you, you live a long life. But you never know. There's been many men and women in my life who I can say that are an example to me of what it means to do that. There have been many people who have taken the time to invest in me. It's not just enough to say, I'm going to live for the glory of God. You have to give it to others. One of my favorite quotes is, the gospel came to you on its way to somebody else. So if you're in the room today and you've experienced a life-changing truth that Jesus is the Son of God and died for your sins so that you could have eternal life, don't just sit on it. Take it to somebody else. Share that with somebody else. Pray with somebody else. Be life and life-giving for somebody else. You're not condemning. You're not bringing down the hammer because you're broken too. But you're sharing the love of God with others. And that's what Moses is saying here. Live every second like it matters. So I want you to think about this. If you've never seen the movie Interstellar, I'm probably going to ruin it for you and I apologize, but it's been out for a long time, so it's shame on you. So essentially, at the end of the movie, there's this crazy trippy scene where the, the main character goes in this three-dimensional portal, I guess, and sees his life sees all the different parts of his life in one room all at the same time. It's super trippy and weird. You just, try, just trust me. And he starts to realize that he has the opportunity to interact with that time to tell his daughter who's in the room all this scientific stuff so that they can create what he's in. It's, again, super trippy, really awesome. And he, ha he finally figures it out and starts to communicate with, with her through the second hand of a watch about when using Morse code and she starts to translate into this crazy formula and figures out how time works and, and all that kind of stuff. I want to ask you two questions and then I'm going to have an invitation at the end and I want you to respond to those two questions. 
first question is this. If you had the opportunity, and I don't think we do, but if you had the opportunity to look at your life as a whole after you die, and tell yourself something to do, what would it be? Yeah, I'm going to tell you my answer. I wouldn't go back and try to fix all the things I did wrong when I was in elementary school. I wouldn't go back and try to do all those things. I would share this message to make every second count. Because you can see your whole life and you can see how it begins and how it ends. But my question for you is, what would you tell yourself? Because you're in that part now where I believe we either go to heaven or hell based on what we do with this idea of God and Jesus. And so what would you tell yourself? The second thing is this. The second question is this. Right now, I'm going to ask you this. If you were to make every second count, I want you to think of one thing that you can do for the glory of God. Just start with one. So here's my invitation. There's three people I want to talk to in the room. First one is this. Regardless of what your story is, where you've been, I would love to hear your story. But regardless of where that has been, if you realize for the first time today that your sins have never been forgiven, and you've never trusted Jesus with your life, I want you to come talk to me. I'm going to stand out here at the front. I know it's weird. I'm not going to call you up front. I'm not going to embarrass you. But if that's you today, and you realize for the first time that Jesus is not the way that you've been following, that is not what you have been following for eternal life, and you want to do that today, I want you to come talk to me. The second one is this. You're in the room today, and you, you're a believer, but yet you have not been living your life for the glory of God. I don't want you to come talk to me. I want you to talk to someone close to you. And if you don't have someone close to you, we have some great chaplains in your dorms. We have some great staff in our campus ministries. We have, there's other professors that I want you to go to them today. Someone close in your life, and you're going to see why. And you're going to just tell them why you haven't been living for Jesus, why you haven't been living for God. Someone that you trust, someone you can give this information to, so you can share with them and say, can you pray for me to do that? Some accountability. Here's the third thing. If you're in the room today and you heard that you can live your life for God, for the kingdom, but you're in this weird place, you don't know what that looks like. I also want you to come talk to me because I have some great opportunities for you because I feel like there's someone in the room today, and it's not me, I feel like God has revealed to me this, that there's someone in the room today that wants to live life on mission 24-7. I don't know who it is, and if nobody comes... Great. If somebody comes, great. But at this service, I want you to come talk to me about, hey, I want to live my life for the glory of God, and I want to live my life on mission. I'm not saying you're going to be a pastor. I'm not saying you're going to be a missionary. I'm not even saying you're going to be working uh, in this area. I just know and pray there's someone in this room today who says, I want to live my life differently than I've been living now. You know why I know that? Because I was in a chapel just like you and God spoke to me. And you know what? I, I had someone in my life that I could go to. And I went to him and said, you will not believe what God revealed to me during this chapel about how I'm supposed to live my life. And it's the reason why I'm here today. And I'm not going to tell you how, because that's why you need to come talk to me. And I'll, I'll help you understand what God's calling you to. So I'm going to pray. The chapel band's going to come sing. And I want you to come talk to me. If you've never given your life to Jesus, if you want to know what it's like to live life on mission and if you are in, are in the room and you haven't been living your life for God, I want you to tell someone your life and have them pray for you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly and Gracious Father, we thank you for this day and this opportunity that you have made. You have given us every day as a gift. And Lord, I pray that we would make every second count for the glory of God. I pray that our lives would represent who you are to us and what you did for us on the cross, that we would number our days, that we would make every second count. No matter what you've called our life to be, that we would live life on mission, and that we would be people of God who say, I'm not going to turn against God. I'm not going to uh, honor my own ways, Lord. I'm going to honor you with every second of my day. And I'm going to make every second count for the glory of God. 
And I pray as we sing, that we not just sing it because we're in a, in a church. I pray that we wouldn't just do it out of obligation, but we would praise you for the gift of life that we have every day. It is in Jesus' name we pray.